Let me, well, Matt talked about history. Let me start with a little bit of history, but not in the space of education. Industry. So we have been talking about Industry 4.0 um, a lot in recent years, but it all started when, uh, with the first Industrial Revolution. Right? Before that, you know, there was no organized industry to start with. That was the first revolution. And then subsequently, the emergence of assembly line and also the dimension of electrical uh, energy actually uh, really changed the way industry was organized than it, what it was right after the first Industrial Revolution. And then, just like what Matt mentioned, the changes started to gather pace. And so digital uh, revolution was the next wave that changed a lot of uh, the way industry um, was organized. And now we are in the midst of seeing all the impact of Industry 4.0. Um, Her Excellency has talked about you know, all the different aspects, AI, data science, robotics, machine learning, what have you. Uh, a lot of exciting stuff happening. This is not just changing the way industry is um, going to function. It, is change, it has some implications on education itself as well. So I'll come to that. This is one space. History in another space, medicine. So again, for the longest time in human history, medicine was practiced with quite a bit of just uh, traditional wisdom and a bit of superstition until about three, two or three centuries ago when the discovery of the understanding of microbiology and so on started to inform modern medicine. Things started to change quite drastically in the past century when drug discovery gained a pace. Um, one of the implications was because the, we were able to produce drugs in some more systematic way, medicine became a lot more, just like the assembly line scenario in Industry uh, 2.0. Uh, here, we started to see the popularization or, or the more popular access to, to medical uh, and healthcare. Then technology started to impact the way medicine is practiced. We have seen a lot of that, but we can expect a lot more to come. Well, yesterday at dinner, Dan was asking a few of us um, you know, what we expect of the next wave in education. And then one of my colleagues in medicine uh, responded, well, um, with m the medicine example, personalized medicine, for example, uh, regenerative medicine, for example, a lot of very exciting things are happening in medicine because of the way technology has evolved, because of the connectivity that we can afford today and so on. So medicine 4.0, if I may call that, okay, is probably the next frontier in medicine. So now let's take a look at education. Well, so Dan had this wonderful picture in his first presentation, um, the Bologna classroom, right? But depending on how you look at history, but roughly speaking, that was when a formal university was, was uh, set up, right? Roughly, let's say, a thousand years ago, thereabout. The reality is that picture that he showed, the, the classroom setting, has never changed, right? I mean, in details, it might, might have changed, but that, the, the essence of it has not changed. One of the big revolutions, or in, in my opinion, was actually the invention of the blackboard. About, I think it was about two decades ago. Okay. Um, uh, two centuries ago. <laughs> yes, two centuries ago. Two decades ago was the demise of the blackboard. <laughs> yeah, two centuries ago. Right. Um, that, why, why do I think it's, it's a revolution? Because of the blackboard, actually, um, again, the, it opened the door to mass access. Now, 
suddenly it's easy to, to lecture to a class of you know, a few hundred with this. But ever since then, there's hardly been any change, right? Okay, the blackboard might have evolved to green board, white board, but nonetheless, it's still a board. The next big wave might have been technology. So uh, I still remember the days when we had all these uh, overhead projectors, transparencies. That was a big thing, right? Uh, subsequently, very quickly, you know, PowerPoint, PDF, and all that. OK, so we think that that's, that's great. Well, it, that has become the norm today, isn't it? I mean, you have seen all these uh, examples of this technology. So we have been asking ourselves, so well, what next? Well. So, Matt has mentioned one example, MOOC, that only appeared for one, basically one year, but it, it sort of captured the beginning of a new wave in the sense that it involved the use of technology, not just within the classroom. It took, it took the context of education out of the classroom. So that's one paradigm shift. Um, it involves technology in more than just a passive transformation of your lecture notes or content onto you know, the, the, the PowerPoint or whatever. So it, it actually, and also it, for the first time, made it highly accessible. We're talking about you know, the, um, equal access to education, uh, education and so on. So, in many ways, that sort of captured um, a paradigm shift. Now, that is what happened. It was not tremendously successful. Um, there were adjustments along the way. But nonetheless, it opened up our minds to question what is going to happen. Well, so let me just show you a few things that how that has actually impacted us at NTU before I share my own views about the classroom of 2013. As I've told you earlier, so this is a typical classroom now at NTU. This is how a group will be sitting with all the LED screens and so on. This has become very common in our, our class, right? Okay, so that is one thing that has impacted um, how we deliver. This is our Lee Kong Chin School of Medicine, AR, VR, and all what have you coming into play. Okay, so we can't, well, cadavers are very hard to come by these days. Medical school students don't get enough practice. So what, we, what do we do? Well, we get virtual <laughs> um, human skeleton, cadavers, and so on, right? So that students can actually keep practicing. So that is leveraging technology. Um, we also use not just this virtual reality, the real reality thing, um, 3D printed body parts, well, pseudo body parts, right? To, for, for students to practice and you know, feel and so on. So we, we supplement all this using modern technology. Um, we have partnered E.ON to venture into AR, VR. Not at a big scale yet, but for ex an example is, for example, um, we have a module on safety. Safety in especially experimental sciences and engineering is tremendously important. You must learn how to deal with emergencies, okay, accidents, and so on. However, I don't want to be creating an accident for the students you know, every semester for the student to learn. So that is an excellent example of where ARVR has been very, very impactful. They can experience it without putting their own lives in danger. Right? And increasingly, we are doing that. So these are just some snapshots of what um, all this technology uh, has actually impacted the way we're doing. And then, well, again, so AR, VR, and the use of mobile devices. So I would, you've heard a lot about 
the, the development and exciting, ex even more exciting examples from Matt, I won't belabor this point. Let me come to the whole point here now. What's going to happen next? Well, the first thing I want to say is that I will not dare to predict what kind of technologies I should expect 10 years from now. Uh, I don't have the domain knowledge or the expert knowledge. Uh, and at the, at the rate things are going, I really don't know. But to some extent, it is irrelevant. And the reason is this. I feel that actually in education, we have not been leveraging the mature technologies enough to transform the way we deliver education. So there's more than enough that we can do with what is already available today. That's one thing. And the second thing is I think with, so there are two ways in which the current developments will, will influence education. One is just how do we want to prepare the students for the world and the workplace of tomorrow. The second is actually just the way we carry out education or practice education itself. So pedagogy, as well as actually the goal, the philosophy of it. So I think there are a few um, serious trends that we have to um, look into. I call them transcending boundaries. The first one, we have been talking a lot about transcending disciplinary boundaries. And admittedly, I think more and more um, multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary programs and causes have emerged. But most of us in higher education are still locked in the disciplinary boundaries. We still think, I, I'm a mathematician. When I talk to my colleagues, 90% of them will say, oh, when I was a student, that was like 20, 30 years ago, right? I had to learn calculus, linear algebra, blah, 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 blah. They would rattle off a whole suite of topics, and they would say, so students of today must also learn all these. But if you, if you do that, and then layer on interdisciplinary content and so on, it would take them 10 years to graduate, right? Um, they, would, they would wear out. So I think we need to relook. There's space for disciplinary depth, but there is also a lot of room to reorganize content. The second one is even more pressing, the boundary between theory and practice. In schools and universities, we are incredibly good at the former, but we pretend we know the latter. So when we say, you know, we infuse practice, is, is what comes out of our own imagination. But increasingly, what we are doing at NTU is in, to involve our industry partners. We have worked with about 180 industry partners through our research projects and so on. And what, one of the things, exciting things that's happening right now is that we are co-creating content. We are co-delivering some uh, content with them. So we bring them into the classroom with us so that the students can understand and hear from the practitioner's point of view. Hard and soft skills, most importantly, the, what should students know? They should be able to do things that machines cannot do better than us. So creativity, communication, collaboration, and so on. How do we infuse all these? Time and space, I think that's where the most disruption will be. With all the exciting developments, I was just telling Dan last night that I think the education of tomorrow will be a lot less structured. It will, it's not just learning on demand, but a lot more than that. You, 
the, 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 the learner gets to curate, the, gets to decide you know, how to mix and match and so on. So a, a, lot, of, a lot more interactive there. And then transcultural, because te technology enables us to break down the barriers of the confines of time and space. So it has to become more, tra more transcultural to benefit us. Let me just end with four external forces that are going to shape all this. We have heard about the impact of AI and data. I think that is going to impact how education is going to be like. It will be a lot more personalized. We can. How you learn, what you learn, you know, your interests, your, your approach, and so on, it will be a lot more personalized. New technologies, whatever they come along the way, will help us um, enable us to do more. But as I said, existing ones will be, be more than enough. And finally, I think this has been underemphasized for many years, learning science. We know very little about the science of learning. And we need to invest a lot more in understanding that so that that will it will be a virtuous cycle. The research will inform how we do the practice. And then together, okay, through the virtuous cycle, I think the education of tomorrow can meet the needs of tomorrow. So with that, thank you very much.